Hi, my name is Matt Holliday and welcome back to my class on programming in Go. So I'm going to start with concurrency in Go. I had a section on concurrency, but now I'm going to talk about how we do that in the Go programming language. I'm going to introduce something called communicating sequential processes. Now it's an idea that goes back to the 70s, but it's not shown up in a lot of actual programming languages. It's an important feature of Go because it provides us a powerful and simple model for solving a lot of basic concurrency problems. And the features in Go that do that are channels and Go routines, which I'm going to show you also in this section. I want to start with channels. A channel is like a Unix pipe, and if you're not familiar with Unix pipes, it's a way of sending data from one program to another. Typically on the command line, you type a program name and a vertical bar and another, and it redirects the output from one program to the input of another. Now what's interesting about it is that the programs run in parallel, more or less, or at least they run concurrently, depending on your hardware. And as data comes out of the first program, it's read by the second program. These pipes and channels in Go, for example, have a couple of properties. One is the stuff goes in one end, it comes out the other. So they're unidirectional and stuff comes out in order. And it keeps coming out until the writing end is closed. The important difference is that in Go, it's safe to have multiple readers and writers for a pipe. Okay, normally on the command line, there's really no way to actually have multiple readers and writers on a pipe between programs. But when we set up channels in Go, we're gonna see that we can have multiple readers and writers. Now, when I talked about concurrency, I said, hey, you know, if multiple people can read and write things, we get into trouble. But actually, the fact that channels are safe for this purpose, that solves a lot of our underlying concurrency problems if we use them. The second thing I want to introduce is the notion of a sequential process. And this is sort of like a classic thing in computer programming, right? I've got a loop, read some data, do some calculation, write some data. So if you think about it, if I run grep on a text file, I have a loop in there, it reads a line, looks to see if the line matches, and if it does, prints it out. Or maybe it's the inverse, if it doesn't match, it prints it out. Okay, so we're doing things one, two, three, and then we go loop around and do them again in that order. And there's not really any concurrency in it. We don't think about it that way. The interesting thing happens when we put these two parts together, right? We have sequential processes talking through channels. The channel is the communicating part of the communicating sequential processes. And what it does is acts as either a buffer or a synchronization point, allowing these sequential processes individually to be concurrent as a group, okay? And if you think, go back to the Unix pipe example, the first program writes something, the second program reads from the pipe, first program writes some more, second program reads some more. It's going on, but exactly when they read and write doesn't have to be necessarily at the same instant. And so the flexibility of these channels allows us to say, hey, these things can be scheduled. So each of these sequential processes, it doesn't think about concurrency in itself, but as we throw them across multiple cores, they can be scheduled in a way where the result is a concurrent or even a parallel program. They can sort of run in parallel as data flows from one part to the next. Why is CSP valuable? Okay, so concurrency is always hard. I mean, we just didn't evolve to do that in our heads any more than we evolved to do third semester calculus at eight o'clock in the morning. But the CSP model can make it in a lot of cases less hard. It allows us to write asynchronous code in a synchronous style, and that's very powerful. And I think this quote from Andrew Gerund is really to the point. Okay, we can do some very simple things in this model of, hey, I write something and it sends a message to something else, and how the messages get scheduled and how these somethings get scheduled across the CPUs is not my problem, it just works. So one of the key components in Go is the Go routine. And the Go routine is just a play on words. It's coroutine, but we use the Go keyword in Go to start it, and so it got named a Go routine. Very clever, okay? It's really easy to start a Go routine. We just put the Go keyword in front of a function call, and that function call actually starts an, an independent thread of execution in the program, okay? I probably shouldn't have used the word thread because a Go routine is not a thread. In fact, a Go program can have tens of thousands of Go routines and Go will take care of the scheduling them properly on however many threads it needs based on your CPU hardware. Now, 
There is a catch, and we'll be talking about this as we go along, all through this whole section on concurrency, this and the following segments. And that is, when we start a Go routine, we have to think about what stops it. Okay, the number one way to get a memory leak in Go is to end up with a Go routine leak. And that is, a Go routine that's become orphaned. It's stuck, it's not going to finish, and it holds on to the resources it has. And if you're building a server, that kind of leak is bad. And we'll talk about how not to get there. So the other piece in Go is the channel, which is actually a data type. And it represents a way of communicating. If you're familiar with Unix pipes again, it's like that. It's a one-way channel. You put stuff in one end, it comes out the other. Okay. And it comes out in the right order. And eventually you can close one end of it to signal to the other end that there won't be any more data. But it's safe for multiple readers and writers. Now, a channel can really have two purposes. Okay, if you think of it as a communication tool, obviously we can pass data through it. And that's a very powerful model by itself. We talked about, you know, sharing in a, in a concurrent program is bad. And so an alternative to sharing is that we actually transfer ownership of data. So I have, say, one Go routine, think of it as a sequential process, that generates some piece of data, sends it through a channel to another, and by sending it, it's like I'm giving up ownership, it's yours now. And in theory, as long as only one Go routine has that data at a time, then the race conditions we talked about aren't really a problem. So we can think about a way of transferring data and transferring ownership. It also has a role as a synchronization tool, and that's something we'll get at. But sometimes we need to actually think in a concurrent program about the concurrency. And the fundamental relationship in concurrency is this notion of happens before. One thing happens before something else. Well, with a channel, that's kind of simple, because anything you receive has been sent, right? The send has to happen before the receive. Now, we're going to get into more detail on exactly how that works in a later segment, and there's differences between whether the channel is buffered or not as exactly how that works. So, but I just want to put it out here now as a starting point that one of the things about a channel is it can be used only to really communicate the idea of something is done. I want to very briefly illustrate that with this slide. You know, here's our partial order, but think about this now as, you know, parts of a program with channels between them, right? There's a happens before relationship. The arrow from 1 to 2a, right? Anything coming into 2a, it happened before in 1, and 2a happened before 2b, and so on. So, again, there's a notion of channels can help us when we do want to think explicitly about concurrency. They can help us deal with the happens before relationship. So I'm now going to move back to my laptop, and we're going to start actually building out a program. I want to use some channels and Go routines to get the idea across. And the first thing we're going to do is parallel get through HTTP, right? We did this exercise where we went to XKCD, and we had to get 2,400 pieces of metadata about comics, and it was slow because we did them one after another. Well, we don't have to do them one after another. We can do them in parallel. And so that's what I want to demonstrate now, All right? I need to start out with some piece of data I'm going to pass around. And we're going to call it a result. And it's going to have three things in it, okay? We're going to have a URL that we looked at. We're going to have an error. And for now, we'll just treat the URL as a string. And we want one more thing. We're going to think about how long did it take to get the web page all right, so we're going to do one more thing. We're going to calculate a duration as call it latency. All right. Now, what we want to do with this is we actually want to go and get something from a web page. And so what we're going to do is have a function called get. And it's going to take a URL, but it's going to take something else. And the something else is going to be the channel that we return the data on, okay? So I'm going to run each get in a Go routine by itself. It's going to go out to the web, get some data, and then it's going to put its result into a channel and send that back. Again, it's going to communicate its result by putting it in a channel, and it's going to be a safe way to do that. So our channel is going to be a channel of result. Now, the channel keyword by itself says, hey, this is a channel that takes results. I'm going to show you a neat trick. 
when we pass a channel to a function as a parameter, for example, we can restrict it. We can restrict the use of that ch channel either to the write end or the read end. And of course, in this case, we want our get function to return some data. So we're going to give it the write end only. All right, it will have the ability to write data back in the channel, but it won't be able to read any data from the channel. So we'll get the time we started so we can calculate the latency. We're going to do our get. And all we need to do is call get on the URL. We're not doing anything fancy here at all. Okay, but we need to deal with the possibility that there was an error. And if there wasn't an error, then of course one of the things we have to do is close the body again, right? To make sure the socket gets closed. Now, if there was an error, we're just going to communicate back the fact that there was an error. And so we're going to send on the channel, and this is how we do it. It's a left pointing arrow at the channel variable, and we're going to send it some result. Okay. Now, if we don't have an error, then we're going to calculate a latency. And I'm going to do one little trick here. I'm going to round it to the nearest millisecond. Just so I don't get weird decimal numbers of, you know, it took 1.38577 whatever seconds. Because that's not nice to look at. And again, if I get a normal result, I'm also going to send something on the channel. Okay, what am I going to send? Well, in the first case, I'm going to send the URL, the error, and I'm going to put in zero for the latency because we didn't calculate it. And if I have a result, I'm going to send the URL, nil for the error because there isn't one, and the value of t. All right? So that's my get function. And again, I'm going to run that in a Go routine by itself. Uh, whoop. Little typos. All right, and now it's complaining I haven't used get yet, but that's fine. We're going to do that. So what am I going to do in my main function? Well, the first thing I need is I need a channel to actually send stuff in. Right? And we do that by using make. Except now instead of making, for example, a slice, we're going to make a channel of result. And that is right there. That's a type. Chan plus the result type name for the struct, for example, says, hey, it's a channel of the result type. Okay. And then I need some actual URLs. And so we'll come back. I'll fill this in here in a second. Okay. And over my URLs, I'm going to do something. And what I'm going to do, so what I could normally do is I could just call get URL and get some data back. But instead, I'm going to call get. I'm going to pass it the channel. Okay. And I'm going to stick the go keyword in front of it. Now, go again. The go keyword wants a function call. And so here I have a function call. I've called the function with the parameters, the URL that I want it to go get, and the channel it's going to use to return the results. So results is a channel. And we're giving the right end of the channel to the get function that's going to run in this Go routine. So it has a way to communicate the data back. Fine. So that's one part of it. Actually, we're going to, we need to do this. So I'm going to just going to, again, I'm going to loop over the size of the list. And there is a reason I'm doing it this way. And I'm going to read the channel. Okay. So again, I have a left facing arrow, but now it's in front of my channel name. Okay. So results with the arrow before it says do a read on the results channel. And of course, the result of that is going to get put into this variable R, right? I'm, I'm using a short declaration to create an R. And we're going to do one thing if it's nil and something else if it's not. Okay. So 
what we want to do here, and we'll just go ahead and print these, I'm going to use log. Instead of using Fumpt, I'm going to use the log package. And the reason I'm doing that is that'll give me a timestamp, and we'll be able to see some timestamps on these log entries as they come popping out. And if there's no error, the difference here is I'll print out the latency. And by making the latency come out as a string, it's going to get formatted. And so it'll say like 250 milliseconds. That's convenient, particularly since I rounded it to the nearest millisecond. So the only thing I'm missing here is a list of URLs to go to, right? So if you look at this program again, I've got a result structure to hold some data that's coming back from each get of a URL. I've got a get function I'll put in a go routine, which goes out to the web, get some data, which I'm not even looking at the data. All I'm asking is how long did it take to go and read like the front page of this website or that website, All right? And we're putting it back into a channel. So now here's an important point, whether we have an error or not, I'm going to put something in the channel. So I know that for every URL I started, I'm going to get a result of some kind, either it's an error result or it's a normal result. Okay. So I start a certain number of Go routines based on how many URLs I'm looking up. All right. And then based on the number of URLs again, I'm going to go and read results. Okay. And I'm going to discuss why I'm doing it that way in just a second after I finish typing in a bunch of URLs, which, you know, maybe I should have done this before. All right. Put in some websites. Okay, now I want to come back to this question of, you know, this list, obviously I have four URLs. I'm going to start four Go routines. Why am I doing this second for loop this way? And the answer is I need to read only four results. Okay, because here's the thing about channels, they block. If there's no data to read and I go to read it, I have to wait for data. Now, this is no different. If I wrote a program that read from the command line, so I start a command line program, I'm sorry, I'm going to start a command line program, it's going to read from standard input, and I'm expected to type something. So what does the program do if I don't type anything? Well, the answer is it waits. It waits for me either to type a line of text and hit return, or it waits for me to hit control D and say, there's no more data. Okay. So if I were to range over the channel itself, which I can do, right, it would read until the channel closes, but I'm not closing the channel. And I'll get into that in a second. I'm not closing the channel. So I just need to make sure I don't read more times than there could be data in the channel to read, or I'll get stuck right here waiting for data that's not going to arrive. And that's also why I made sure again that every time I start a go routine, it's going to provide me a result an error or a valid data, but it's going to give me a result. So I'm going to get four go routines and four results and then stop. Okay. Now you could ask the question, why don't I close the channel? And so I'm going to tell you something now in advance. We'll get back to this later. You can only close a channel once. Okay. You can't close a channel. It's already been closed. Well, I have four go routines and the question would be, well, who closes the channel? Which one of them? And it's like this old joke about, well, the last person out turned the lights off, but there's no really way of knowing between the go routines, which one is last. So which one should close the channel? Okay. And that gets us into a little more complexity than I'm going to deal with right now, but I don't need to. In a lot of these cases, as long as I know I started n number of go routines, I know I need to read n number of responses. And if we think about it that way, then it stays very simple. All right, so I actually believe this program is ready to run. So let me scare up a command line. And there it goes. Okay. Now I get this little thing. They all happened within about a second or so. And this is how long they took. Now, if I add up those times, you know, I get 
about three seconds worth of time total, but it didn't actually take me three seconds of clock time to run this. And in fact, I could do that again, time it, and the whole thing took less than a second, all right, total, even though, again, if I add this up, you know, if I add up these times right here, they come to well over a second. So clearly, they didn't run sequentially, okay? The actual time it took me to do each URL lookup if I add those together, it is less than the total time it took clock time to run my program. So in this next example, I'm going to show the power of Go Routines and Channels to solve a data race, a condition where we would otherwise have an unsafe operation in a concurrent program. Again, I'm going to show you how a channel can help solve that. So I'm going to start with a simple web server. And of course, this is nothing new, right? I've got a main program that starts a server, and I've got a handler that's going to print out an incrementing number, okay? And it's, it's not very exciting. It just comes back and prints some HTML and says, you got the number, whatever, right? So one way to do that is to actually have some sort of variable, and it's going to have to be outside the function, right? If it's going to increment, it can't be a local variable of the function. And I could do this. And the only problem is this is unsafe, right? The increment operation is a read, modify, write. Now, as I said before, the web server built into the Go standard library is concurrent. If I were to hit this web page fast enough, I would start seeing some problems. Numbers would get skipped. Now, I'm not going to demonstrate that in this segment. I just don't have the setup right now to do that. I'm just going to tell you that this increment isn't safe, and if I ran this program with enough input, it would cause a problem. So how can I solve that? Well, there's another approach. And the other approach is to say, you know, instead of having next ID be an actual value, what if I caused it to be a channel of integers? Okay, and then instead of actually trying to increment it, I just read a value out of it. And so now I just need one more piece. I need a function whose only job is to start sending numbers, right? Now, this is a Go routine that'll basically just run forever. It'll run until the program stops. And all it does is keep generating numbers and putting them into the channel, okay? And before I start my handler, I start my counter. And my counter will start generating numbers. Now, you may think, well, it's, if, if nobody's using my web server, that thing's just going to spin and start just generating all these numbers from 1 to a billion to 10 billion to 100 billion billion. And the answer is, well, no. Okay? Because in the normal use of channels, I can't write to it unless somebody's ready to read from it. Now, we already said, if the channel is not ready to be read from, you block. Okay, and that's, again, that's no different than trying to read input from standard input. If I haven't typed anything on standard input, the program has to wait for me to type something, right? So the writer here inside counter, where I write to the channel, can't actually do anything until there's somebody ready to read from it. And the same thing up here. The reader can't read until there's somebody ready to write. Now, that's not a problem for the handler because this loop down here hasn't got anything, it's not waiting for anything. So as soon as somebody comes in and says, hey, I want to get a web page with a counter, okay, it's going to try to read, and counter will be able to write the next value, and then counter will stop, and then the, the handler will finish. And we'll just do this over and over again. So it's perfectly safe, and it's reasonably efficient, okay, reasonably efficient, not super efficient. Now, I showed you the program with next ID as a channel that's a global variable. And I don't necessarily like that design, but I can't pass it as a parameter to the handler because the handler can only take the two regular parameters defined for an HTTP service. What I can do is I can take my channel event and create a name type from that, and then take my handler and turn it into a method on that type, right? 
And when the handler runs on it, well, then it reads from the channel because that's the receiver for the method, which is a channel. Okay. And then my counter can take a channel as a parameter. And so now I can come down here in my main program, right, and create the channel variable. Now, the interesting thing here is I've got to make sure it ends up being a variable of type, this next channel type, right, and not just a plain channel event. Because that way, it has the right type to have the handler method on it. Right? So I've created a channel, put it into a variable of the right type, passed it to the counter function, and again, that works because the underlying type is channel event, and then turned around and passed the handler to handle func. And so now every time the handler runs, it runs on the receiver, which is the channel, and it reads from it, and now I've created the object-oriented version of that program. So I'm back in the slides for a second because I want to illustrate the third example I'm going to walk through. And it's a very interesting example. It's very old. It's actually more than 50 years old. Um, back in the time before Unix, just before Unix was created, when people were thinking about the kind of pipes and filters that would work on the Unix command line, there was an idea about using that to calculate prime numbers. Right? If you think about it, I can start a thing that generates numbers and pipe it into a filter that drops all the numbers divisible by 2, and I pipe that into some other filter that drops all the numbers divisible by 3, and we're going to redo that as an example with Go Channels. So it started at Bell Labs in the 60s. It was used in as an example in one of Tony Hoare's papers on CSP in the 70s, and now, more recently, it shows up as an example Go program in the documentation on the Go, web Go website. And so I'm just going to bring it and show it to you. But first, I want to animate this just a little bit. We're going to start out with a main program, and it's going to create a Go routine. I'm going to call it the generator, because the function of the generator is just to start making numbers. Okay? And as we get a new prime number from it, and we're going to start with 2, right? We're going to ignore 1. 1 is never considered prime. Right? We get 2, and as when we get that number, we say, okay, so that's a number we need to filter out, 2 and all the multiples of 2. So we'll create another Go routine called the two filter, and we'll attach it on the channel in between generator and main, which really means we'll take the channel that went from generator to main and make that go into the two filter and create a new channel coming out of the two filter going back to main. Okay, then we get three. Well, three is also going to be prime, so we'll create another filter. When four gets generated, it never gets there. It gets removed by the two filter. When 5 comes along, we'll create a 5 filter, and again, we'll add it to this little chain of channels and filters. Okay, 6 will get gobbled up, 7 will make a filter, 8 will get gobbled up by number 2, 9 will buy number 3, and so on. So as we get more of these numbers, a lot of them will drop out. So all main will ever see are prime numbers, and every time it sees a new prime number, it's going to create another filtering go routine, hook it into the channel that it's getting numbers from, and create a new channel back to itself. Okay, so this is the illustration, and now I'm going to write the code. So before I start writing the main function, I'm going to start with things like the generator, because that's easy. All right, the generator, and we're going to give it a limit. This is not in the example on the Go website, but I don't want it to run forever. So we're going to give it some limit. It's going to run until that limit hits, and it's going to take a channel again, in this case just integers, okay, and in this case, it's getting the right end of the channel. So all it can do is write the channel. It won't be able to read it. That's fine. Doesn't need to. Okay. And I said before, we're going to start at 2 just because 1 is not really considered a prime number. And I just don't want to add any the logic anywhere else to deal with 1. So we'll just do it right here. We'll just start off with number 2. And every time we make a number, we'll put it into the channel. So this works just like the counter Go routine in the last one, except when we get to the end, we will close the channel. Um, I want to just explain this with the diagram. The generator is going to run until it stops. When we've given it a limit, it's going to count up to some number, it's going to stop, it's going to close its channel. And we're going to set this program up so there's a domino effect. When the generator closes, then number two will see that the channel coming into it is closed. It'll close its outgoing channel. And so like a wave of dominoes, these filters will all just close until the main program sees the last channel coming into it close. 
And when the main program sees that channel close, well, that's just like seeing a socket close or seeing end of file on a file. It's going to know there's no more data to work with, and we're done, and it will just complete its loop. OK, so let's go back to the code, and we'll continue fleshing. And the next piece we need is an actual filter. right? And a filter, again, we're going to run it in a Go routine. So each filter needs to know a source channel. OK, so that's a channel it can read from. Where are the numbers coming from? A destination channel. Well, that's where it can write numbers out, assuming they're still allowed to be written out. And a particular prime number it's going to filter on. OK. Now, we're going to write this loop a little differently. So let me just put it there. But whenever that loop is done, we're going to say, close the destination channel. So when the loop is finished, close the destination, and then the next thing will see it. And the reason it sees it, we're going to use a slightly different for loop. We're going to range over the source channel. OK, we can do that. What do we get? Well, we get a sequence of values that come out of the channel. And this loop will block at the top. Every time we go back to source to get another piece of data, if there isn't one ready, then we pause right there. And when there is, then we'll go execute the loop body until the channel closes. When source closes, this loop is done. We'll just exit the loop, right? So it's a for loop over the values in the channel until the channel closes, right? And so again, when I say, and when that happens, we just close the next one. So there's a little bit of logic we have to do in here. What is i? Well, i will be an integer, because that's what's coming out of the channel. Right? And so if it's not divisible by the prime number, we'll pass it on. Okay? What we're doing here is modular arithmetic. So if you think about it, you know, 3 divided by 3, well, 3 divides into 3 evenly. There's nothing left over. And that's what the modulo function does, if you're not familiar with it. It calculates a remainder. If there's a remainder, then it was not divisible by i, and we're going to pass it along. Okay? So if I start this filter with the number 2, right, 4, 6, 8, 10, and so on, they will all divide cleanly by 2 with no remainder, and we'll throw those numbers on the floor, and we'll pass along odd numbers. Only the odd numbers will get past this filter. All right, so that gives us a generator and a filter. Okay. We need the main program, and I'll just go ahead and do this. We're going to have another function that I haven't shown yet. And the main function, I'm just going to give it a fixed number as an upper limit. So it'll stop when it gets to 100. Okay. Our output, we expect to see numbers like 2, 3, 5, 7, and so on. Now, not just odd numbers, okay, but prime numbers like these. Okay. These are not numbers. Again, they're, they're not divisible by any other number but themselves. So all we have to do now is we have to write the sieve function. And again, we're going to give it the limit value. Okay. So the first thing we have to do is make a channel, right? Because when we start this up, there's always going to be at least one channel. Okay. And that's the channel that's coming back to main from the generator, which is the very next thing. So the very next thing we go is we start the generator with the limit and this channel. Right? And it will immediately start trying to send numbers back, but it will block because we're not ready to read it. Okay? And that's the rest of this thing is we're going to have a for loop. Now, I'm actually going to write this as an infinite for loop. So I'm going to drop into the slides for a second to illustrate this. Because when I start this process, I made a channel CH. That's the original channel that runs from the generator to the main program. Right? But each time I go through the loop, whatever that channel was, it's going to end up over here. You know, and if I make a new one, this new one's going to end up over here. And so the channel that's coming into main going forward, we'll call it CH1 or something, Every time I go through the loop, I'm going to make a new channel that is actually the channel that main is looking for for numbers. And because of that, well, it can't be part of a range operation in the actual for loop. That doesn't work. So I'm going to go back to the code. Again, I've got my infinite for loop. 
and I'm going to read my channel. Okay. Now, what's going on here? Okay, you, you saw maps, for example, right? And we said the map, you could read a value or you could read two values. And if you read two values out of a map, the second one was a Boolean saying, well, was the value really there? We can do the same thing with a channel. It has a two value read operator. The first is the actual value that we get out of the channel. And the second one is a Boolean that says, is the channel closed or not? So as long as that's okay, we're fine, right? So the very first thing I'm gonna do is if not okay, I'm gonna do a break and that's gonna end my program, right? The, when we see this channel, whatever it is, close, right? We'll try to read from it, it will fail, we'll get a not okay, we'll break, that will end the program. So then the very first thing we do after that is we make a new channel. And we start a filter, right? With the channel that was coming into me, the new channel, and whatever that value of prime is. Okay, so I made this new channel, and then I made the filter, and then I update my view of the channel coming into me with the new channel coming out of the filter. And again, this is the reason why, this assignment is the reason why I can't do this up here, okay? that's not going to work. Okay, so this has to be an infinite loop. And then I need to do one more thing down here, and that is all right, I'm actually going to print the number out. Okay, and I could print them on separate lines. I'm just going to make them print out on one line. Okay, so again, I read the channel. If I got a prime number, I made a new channel, I started a filter, with the source of that filter being the old channel that I was reading from, and the output being this new channel, to filter this particular new prime number. And then I swapped my view of the channel that I'm reading from. Okay, and when I read from that channel and it's closed, then I'm gonna break out of this loop and the program's gonna stop. And again, right, so the generator is going to run until it hits the limit, close its channel. A filter runs until it sees its channel, its input channel close. It closes its output channel, and this causes the domino effect, right, until we get to here and the main program stops. So that's the logic that I'm using to convince you that this program is going to work. Okay, so we'll open up a command line again. And there we go. We're done, right? It actually calculated all those pretty much instantaneously. And if I wanted this to look just a little bit nicer, I'd have put a print line in the bottom so when I run it again, I get a final new line, okay, after all these numbers. And notice my last number is 97. So again, it, you know, 98, 99, and 100. Those are not primes, and it stopped. Now, is this an efficient program? And the answer is no. If I change my limit to be, I don't know, you know, 100 billion, am I going to like the runtime? And the answer is no. There's a lot of communication overhead in this program because I'm making all these Go routines and I'm making the channels between them. And so compared to doing just simple arithmetic in one big loop in my main program, the actual truth is the runtime sucks. Okay, so I would never write this program. It's not an efficient way to calculate prime numbers, but it's a great example of showing you again how we can do channels and go routines and how I can start a new, ch a new go routine on the fly and hook it between other go routines with channels. And they all just run, the numbers just flow down the pipeline from one filter to the next to the main program, and I keep adding filters, but the numbers keep flowing down, right? And a lot of them get dropped out by the filters, but I get these are my results, these are the prime numbers. So that's my introduction to concurrency in Go, my first example programs with channels and Go routines, 
and talking a little bit about what goes on with them and how that's a model of something called Communicating Sequential Processes, or CSP. And for a lot of problems, it's a very simple approach, right? Because a lot of times what we really need to do is something like the first program. I need to go out and hit a bunch of websites, and I want to do it in parallel because it's faster. And doing it this way with channels and go routines is just faster. I had an example where I showed how I can solve a, a race condition with a go routine. And then I had an example which is just sort of like go routines galore or channels galore. You know, just showing you how I can do fun things with channels and go routines as a way of demonstrating how they work, even if it's not terribly efficient. Now, in another section, we'll talk about traditional uh, mutexes and other things that we will use sometimes because they are more efficient, but they also can sometimes make the program harder. So again, I think the right place to start with concurrency is Go is channels and Go routines, and that's what I've shown to you today.